the Icebrook saga story begins with a letter. Sent to the commander by Imperator Bangar Ruinbringer, the leader of the Blood Legion of Char. In this letter, Bangar congratulates the commander on their recent victory against the elder dragon Kralkatorik, and muses on the changing state of Tyria in the wake of the dragon's death. He has turned his thoughts to the impact that these changes will have on his fellow Char, now that they are not being pulled in every direction by the threat of the dragon. In celebration, he has invited several key allies, such as the commander and their guild, and asked all the imperators of the Char legions to bring their best and brightest to a celebration in Grothmar Valley in the Blood Legion homelands. Bangar also explains that he has brokered a ceasefire with the Flame Legion, the fourth legion of magic-wielding Char whose history on Tyria has been one of great turmoil. This is significant, because until now the Flame Legion has been treated with great prejudice and distrust by the other legions, embroiled in conflict since the Flame Legion's days as the oppressive head of Char society centuries in the past. Things appear to be changing for the better, but Ritlock's response to his, much more formal summons, reveals tension beneath the surface. Despite Ritlock's misgivings, the commander and the rest of Dragon's Watch take Bangar up on his offer and take a chopper from the Black Citadel to the north. Upon arriving in Grothmar Valley, Tribune Cretia Stoneglow greets the party. Though she is a new face to the commander, Ritlock remembers her from his past as they grew up together. She is Bangar's head of security, and once the pleasantries are done with, she immediately expresses concern over the presence of Aureen in the skies above the valley. The dragon, Cretia says, has been seen flying over the land and firing upon the branded minions that walk there. The commander tries to explain that Aureen is just helping to remove the presence of the corrupted from the Char's home, but the distrust in Cretia's voice doesn't falter. They follow Cretia through the keep to the gathering of Char, where the commander and allies have a prime seat to watch the speech. Standing alone, Bangar Ruinbringer addresses the legions and speaks of no greater force than having the Char combine ranks and come together. The majority of the crowd erupt in cheers when their legions are mentioned, but there are some hecklers that dislike Bangar's pageantry. Following the speech, Bangar calls for a branded devourer to be brought centre stage. Onto the field steps Rylan Steelcatcher, recently promoted to Centurion, to great applause from the gathered Char. Ritlock remarks on how much Ryland has grown, to Cretia's mild amusement, who reminds Ritlock that he's been gone a long while. The Char in the arena proceeds to defeat the Devourer, but at the last moment a large broodmother erupts from the earth and goes to strike with renewed ferocity. The commander and surrounding Char pin the creature down with the aid of long chains, and Ryland tries to kill the broodmother. Just before he can finish the job, there is a disturbance in the air above, and Aureen swoops over and blasts the Branded with a plume of her own crystalline flame, turning it instantly immobile and trapped in a glittering spire. This causes a great disruption, as many Char express their disappointment that their act of ceremony and group catharsis was snatched from them by a dragon. Bangar confronts the commander and criticises Aureen's involvement, believing it to be a show of strength on the commander's part, and leaves in anger after a few choice words to Ritlock and Cretia. The commander finds Ritlock and Brayem praising Ryland after the fight. Ritlock appears reticent in Ryland's presence, and offers up advice on improving his combat technique. Brayem, on the other hand, immediately declares he's going drinking with Ryland, who has offered to show him around the keep. The commander declines to join them, keen instead to smooth relations with the Char of the Valley, and help diminish their feelings of distrust towards Aureen. After the event, and most Char had left, the commander overhears several Char speaking, who hint that the excitement of the day is masking underlying unrest amongst the warbands. Some blood legions speak of spoiling for a fight, whether with outsiders or fellow Char doesn't seem to matter. Others are fearful of outside involvement and the presence of the commander and an elder dragon, Aureen. And Flame Legion Char hints that the treaty isn't all it appears on the surface. Over the next few hours, the commander involves themselves with various activities across the valley, and slowly the Char come to see that the commander and their friends are not here to overthrow Bangar's order, at least, but take part in the celebrations. The commander also meets with various legions, and learns a great deal about the comings and goings in the valley. Ephraim greets glory of the Flame Legion, though not an Imperator, reveals that he has become somewhat of a spokeschar for the Flame Legion. The Char he brought with him are getting used to the treaty and their place in larger Char society. Ephraim also reveals that as a condition of their treaty, they have been forced to surrender their cubs into the Blood Legion's Farrar, where they would forgo their Flame Legion heritage and be raised Blood Legion. In Char culture, parents do not raise their cubs beyond the first year of their lives. 
it is the role of the Farrar to train and teach them the ways of the legions, and over time cubs build their warbands, which become their family going forwards. However, despite this, there is a sense that this path would not have been the Flame Legion Char's first choice. Many of the cubs express great sadness and loneliness, and have experienced relentless bullying by their fellow Blood Legion peers, who still see them as Flame Legion, and as enemies. Malice Sword Shadow of the Ash Legion, secretive and wary, revealed little about the Ash Legion's whereabouts, or why their camp and turnout was so small in comparison to the other legions. She did, however, reveal that there is conflict burgeoning between human separatists and Char renegades. Renegades opposed the treaty between the humans and Char in 1324 AE, and have been rebelling ever since. There are also reports of Char from many warbands lashing out at non-Char visitors to the valley, and they grow more emboldened the more time goes on. Upon leaving her presence, the astute commander picks up on Malice's hint, and finds the real Ash presence in the valley. Hidden beneath the grove of trees is Recon Cove, where Ash Legion scouts are busy at work poring over maps and diagrams. They have been tasked with observing human separatist and Char renegade activity in the area, and report to Malice herself. The Char stationed here have brought along contingency plans should the branded that still stalk the area become too much of a hindrance in their reconnaissance. One such option is this crystal, pointed out by Marjorie, who has taken to standing and watching the agents, and has gleaned tidbits of knowledge on their operations. This crystal, likely imported from Alona with great expense, was used in the Crystal Desert to suppress Kralkotorik's minion activity, when the dragon ravaged the land to the south. Now the Ash Legion keeps it safe and ready, should their base, and the valley, need use of it. Smoda the Unflinching of the Iron Legion is among the char curious of the commander's motivations. He expresses concern now that, as he puts it, the commander has gone from killing dragons to hatching them into the world. After the commander fixes the issue Smoda is having with the Great War Engine in his camp, the char becomes more talkative. Smoda reveals his history and conflict with the Blood Legion, and cautions that Bangar is not nearly as hospitable as he would have outsiders believe. According to Smoda, Bangar only signed the Ebonhawk Treaty, which was an agreement between the Char High Legions, Queen Jenna of Kryta and the Duke of Ebonhawk, to put an end to the conflict between the Char and humans after centuries of bloodshed, as Bangar needed to avoid war amongst the legions, at a time when his resources would be stretched thin from other threats. This implies that Bangar would renege on the treaty should times be more favourable to his political stance, or if he had the military presence he desired. Indeed, Bangar's true motives are gradually revealed to the commander the more time they spend digging around. It appears like Bangar is gathering like-minded char, and the one char message banded by Bangar's Minister of Morale, Verinya Stormsounder, only emphasises this. Verinya has influenced the popular band Metal Legion to include propaganda in their performances. Their song, Bound by Blood, sings of char across legions coming together side by side in battle, and their message soon captivates the attention of char across the valley. Over the day, the commander hears Braham and Ryland's increasingly inebriated conversations. Ryland speaks to Braham about identity, and we learn a stark difference between the way Braham, a young Norn, experiences family, and the obligations placed upon him by Norn society, as they discuss the importance of blood relations and names. Ryland has a distinctly different relationship with his parents, Ritlock and Cretia, and speaks to Braham of the freedom of choosing his own path in life although there is still the hint that Rylan struggles to distance himself from Ritlock's reputation. The night progresses, and before long Braham calls and reveals that his drinking and resulting rowdy behaviour has earned him a place in the Keep's jail. Upon telling Cretia, she agrees, with some exasperation, that the commander should head up to the Keep and pick up the unruly Norn from his cell on her authority. Braham is full of regret, and trudges to the storage racks to retrieve his gear, when he reveals that his bow is missing. This bow, enchanted with ancient Jotun magic, is renowned for being the weapon that is said to be able to bring about the demise of Jormag, the great elder dragon of ice that resides to the north. Worried for its whereabouts, he enlists the help of Marjorie to help find his bow. Meanwhile, the commander joins Ritlock outside Bangar's office. Some char had clashed with vigil soldiers, and Ritlock had to intervene. The tensions in the camp are rising, and Ritlock wants to make Kreisha and Bangar aware before things get too out of hand. They enter the office just as Almora's soul keeper, head of the vigil, is exiting, and hear her accuse Bangar of taking out his differences in opinion on her soldiers instead of on her. 
Now in front of Bangar, Ritlock tries to explain to him that his speech at the rally has done much to rile up the Char. Many Char are angry and scared, which Quisha claims is due to Aureen, but Ritlock emphasises that the Char, having lived in the shadow of Krakotorik for so long, now find themselves at a loss for where they should be pointing their weapons. Many Char are simply looking around for the next threat, and caution must be taken such that the threat isn't decided by prejudice instead of evidence. Bangor dismisses the commander and Ritlock's argument, and claims that if it were not an elder dragon they need to fight against, then it would just be something else. In other words, coming together as Char is important to preempt the next threat. It's foolish to think true peace can ever be achieved. Char history is riddled with war against dragons, each other, humans, and Bangor claims it's not easy to forget that the Char's allies today were once their executioners. Ritlock tries to convince Bangar to let him investigate the strange renegade activity around the keep, but Bangar is very dismissive of the legionnaire. Bangar claims nobody wants Ritlock here at all. He angers Ritlock as he brings up Ritlock's cub Ryland and makes reference to raising him when Ritlock left, and the char come to blows. Pinned down by the throat, Bangar goads Ritlock into killing him and taking his place as Imperator, but Ritlock chooses not to overthrow Bangar and instead slinks away. After the fight, Bangar expresses little remorse and simply states that he'd happily skin Ritlock himself if Thackeray doesn't do it before him. Logan Thackeray is the commander of the Seraph, a human whom Ritlock has fought beside in the past and eventually bestowed membership of his warband to. The commander takes this as yet another example of Bangar's dislike of the involvement of outsiders in Char affairs. Outside, Krisha tells Ritlock that if he wants Bangar to take him seriously, he needs to get evidence that things are awry. She leaves, and Ritlock and the commander begin making their way through the keep. Ritlock reveals that he doesn't think Bangar would openly break the treaty with the humans at this time, as he has so little support and resources, though he cautions more underhand tactics might still be in play. After a short while, the pair are beset by Char looking for a fight. Ritlock isn't just disliked by Bangar, it seems but they are no match for the commander and Ritlock, and are swiftly defeated. Over comms, the commander is called to help Ephraim again. When they arrive, Ephraim and Kazmir explain some Flame Legion cubs, including his daughter, have reported older Char hanging about their Farrar. They have approached the young Char, testing their loyalties to see whether they can be brought to their cause. Ephraim believes them to be renegades, and the commander agrees it's a possibility with the recent events around the camp. The commander needs evidence, but neither Kazmir as a human nor Ephraim as Flame Legion would get far inside without raising suspicion. So Kazmir fashions an illusory disguise of Ryland for the commander. With a new face, the commander makes their way to the keep to look around. Once inside, the commander makes their way to the Farrar. Cubs training here pay them no mind, and the commander makes their way to Primus Sparbreaker, who is all too happy to answer questions from Ryland. Sparbreaker tells Ryland that there are many Char wandering around in Blood Legion colours that he definitely does not recognise as having come up through the Blood Farrar. He also reveals Char he thought at first might be parents have indeed been looking in, one of which was a white-furred Char with one eye who seemed suspicious, and Sparbreaker suggests Ryland look around the bar and mess hall to see where they might have gone to. In the mess hall, the commander cannot see the Char the Primus spoke of, but does see Kreisha and fills her in. The renegades are amongst the Char and stirring up trouble. First she is angry that they have used her son as a disguise, but she soon recognises the importance of the situation, and tells the commander to speak to her loyal guard stationed at the door. The guard has seen the Char. The stranger said he was on his way to see the Asura, who has been helping the Char with their bug problems around the keep. The commander recognises this to be Gorik, and hails him over the comms. Gorik reveals that he has been encouraged to go to the war room by Bangar's office by a group of Char, and does not sound all too enthused by the situation. The Char unfortunately hear Gorik on the comms and search him, smashing the device, leaving the commander to scramble to the war room to intervene as quickly as possible. Outside, the commander hears the Char discussing Gorik's journal, which he has stolen in the hopes of gleaning information on Aureen. Alas, Gorik has filled it with his research on spiders and other creatures, and the exasperated Char are both disappointed and a little disgusted. As the commander goes inside, the Char greet Ryland and seem unperturbed by his presence, though they do query why he isn't leading the expedition with Bangar. Luckily, they chalk the commander's confusion at their question up to Ryland getting drunk with Braham earlier, and let the conversation move on to what to do with Gorik. 
They suggest killing him, as he is of no use to them, but the commander orders them to leave the Asura to Ryland, and the pair are able to exit the room safely. Once outside, Gorik reveals that the Char were trying to determine Orlean's weaknesses, and whether she could kill another Elder Dragon. The commander suggests Gorik stay close to allies for the time being. Outside the keep, Marjorie contacts the commander as Malice's spies have spotted Bangor on the move in the mountains west of the keep. The commander rushes to follow and joins Ritlock and Kreisha in the snow-covered pass. There's a serious storm coming in, and as the group makes their way into the mountains, the cold and wind becomes dangerous. It is revealed that Kreisha has been cut off from Bangar's inner circle of trust, though she is confused as to what exactly she said or did to deserve such treatment. Further up the mountain, the trio find a fire still smouldering in a clearing surrounded by tall, ice-encrusted walls. In the ice are the twitching bodies of ice elementals. Kreisha and Ritlock remember them coming down the mountains to terrorise the keep in their youth. As the comms are experiencing interference from the weather, the commander orders the fire be built up and relit to signal their location to their allies. Before long, several large elementals break free from the ice and attack. The resulting fight just serves to slow the group down, but in the wake of the attack they hear a voice coming to them on the wind. Bangar is up ahead and addressing the warbands who have trekked into the mountain with him. Bangar speaks of the Char being weakened over time, claims they have been declawed and forced to live not as they deserve, and reveals his desire to rectify that great wrong and put the Char first again. The commander reaches the clearing and sees Bangar ahead atop a cliff of ice. Bangar speaks of the commander and Aurene, believing them to be at the forefront of the attack on Char society. The dragon Aurene is, in his eyes, a weapon of oppression that will soon be turned against anyone who dares oppose the pact. Bangar stands above the gathered Char, Ryland at his side, and in his paws he holds Brahim's bow, and declares that he is on his way to claim a dragon for himself and even the odds. The commander tries to follow the Char as they continue into the mountains, but they have broken the bridge across the chasm behind them. Suddenly, a great ice construct erupts from the ground and attacks, much to Ritlock's annoyance, who wants to continue after Bangar. Kreisha reminds him of the danger the construct poses to the Keep and the Farrar, and so he joins the fight. The Ice Construct is not just any ordinary elemental, and after the battle the cold becomes biting and the trio struggle to reach the signal fire before the chill becomes overwhelming. At the fire, the commander and allies discuss the situation. Braham expresses regrets over trusting Ryland after it is revealed that he stole Braham's bow, but Ritlock is adamant that Ryland is just being manipulated by Bangar, though time will tell whether this is a fair assessment. The commander explains that Bangar might be going after Jormag in an attempt to oppose Aurene, and the allies agree that the rally was just a way for Bangar to get the legions together so they would be more receptive to his message, which worked on many Char. On his orders, renegades were working to turn Char to his side for quite some time. The meeting ends with the commander promising to get Ryland back, and the allies began to strategize on what this means for them going forwards. No matter what choices they make, however, all agree that time is of the essence, and a path to go after Bangar must be agreed upon soon.